It's Monday. We're open. Welcome to another edition of Mondays in Midtown. I'm Mark Zinn. Last week, Chris Hansen from Dateline NBC came to St. Louis University as part of the Great Issues Committee speaking series. He was the first speaker. We sat down with him with an exclusive interview. Here's what he had to say about To Catch a Predator. Mr. Hansen, welcome to Mondays in Midtown. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. Um, you've done a lot of things in, with journalism and throughout the world, all over the world. If you had to pinpoint one single story that you think had the most effect on uh, on the world, people's worlds view, if you will. Well, what, what would that one story be? Well, I think um, undoubtedly the one story that's had the most impact is To Catch a Predator, uh, for many different reasons. Um, people identified with it, people saw the danger out there, it created an awareness and a dialogue that didn't exist before, and quite honestly, you know, it, it's dramatic television. A lot of the college students here, they all know you because of To Catch a Predator. Absolutely. And, do you think that it has a negative impact sometimes, like with episodes like South Park that we were talking about earlier? I don't think so. Look, you know, if they make fun of you on South Park or on The Simpsons or on Saturday Night Live, to me that means you've had impact. Mm -hmm. And I've got very thick skin. And the best part of guys your age getting into To Catch a Predator, even though maybe some guys and gals aren't watching it completely for journalistic reasons, is that it's got them watching television news magazines. And the same college students who watch that will follow me into uh, investigations on identity theft, uh, terrorist groups, um, the mortgage meltdown, all these things. And you know, because you are that demographic, it can be fickle. And if you get people to start watching your work at 20, 21, 22, you have them for 20 years, and that, that's 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 significant. Well, you got us sold, our generation at least. Yeah. You got me sold. I, I do like the uh, the investigation series, but you know, you talk to some journalists, some, yeah. some even professors. They're like, well, it's kind of like gotcha journalism. You kind of you kind of to catch a predator isn't how you're supposed to do it. What would you say to that? Well, I would say that um, it was a very innovative crime, and we had to be very innovative uh, while investigating it. You know, if I went to my boss and said, look, we need to do a story on online predators. But all I've got is some dramatic interviews and some video of people typing on a, a keyboard. That's not going to carry it. You know, we had the opportunity to use decoys who knew what they were doing, to use our investigative skills, hidden cameras and microphones, and really show in real time, you know, how this works and who's involved. And at the end of the day, you know, we raised awareness and created a dialogue that didn't exist before. And and. You know, I know there are people who raise questions about whether or not it was appropriate to, you know, have law enforcement do a parallel investigation and arrest these guys after we had done our, our interviews with them. And it's, look, it's open for debate. But what we did accomplish and what we are very strict about at Dateline NBC is being completely transparent about our methodology. You may say, I don't like that. But you can say that because we told you exactly how we did it. And that's important, and we do that every time. So, do you have any regrets with the catch no, back no, on it? None whatsoever. None whatsoever. I think it was a, I think it was a story of our times. I think um, it reminded us that uh, enterprise reporting, impact journalism, stories well told, using you know hidden cameras in, in cases where it's appropriate, uh, are, are very important. Whether it's this or whether it's you know any of the other topics we're currently working on. Get people in college, younger people interested in local news. They're not going to watch, you know, assume they're not going to watch local news or, or read the paper. How do they get information about local news? Well, you got you to make, re make it relevant. You know, you have to explain it in a way that people can understand it. For instance, when we did the mortgage meltdown, right, I didn't know what a collateralized debt obligation was five years ago. I didn't know what a credit default swap was five years ago. I knew what a, what a credit default swap was because a guy who also, as a kid who plays lacrosse with my kid, came up to me at a game and said, I can't get this stuff off my desk fast enough. You need to take a look at it. And so I go into my investigative producers and I say, guys, you know, there's something here. And everybody starts working on it and we understand it and develop it. And, and you know, you have to explain it in a way that, that people understand, which is they packaged, you know, subprime. You know, it's like putting the ground chuck with the, with the, with the sirloin, you know, and calling it, you know, 
uh, something even better than that. You know, it's not that. It's all mixed together. And, and they, didn't, they didn't rate it properly. It wasn't monitored properly. And it, it was the downfall of our economy 18 months ago. Chris Hansen also had some interesting things to say about doing hidden camera investigations in areas and countries that aren't so nice to journalists. But on a personal level, the thing that impacted me most and really brought me to tears was when we went over to Cambodia and we investigated, infiltrated um, a sex trafficking ring in, uh, in Cambodia, about 11 uh, kilometers outside of uh, Phnom Penh a place called Svei Pak, and to see those girls rescued and then go back four years later and to see the improvement in their lives, I mean, that's impact. Has the industry changed over there, that, that sex trafficking industry? It, it, it has. It's still there, and it's still, it's still you know, a, a bad situation, but Svei Pak, as it was, is now a regular village where there is no sex trafficking. These girls who were able to track down are in a school, and they're, they're thriving now. So their lives are completely different. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, that's what we're Thanks a lot. Who has to do some of these hidden camera investigations? You know, not, not, in, in the U.S. is one thing. But going to Cambodia, mm -hmm. going to places like China and India where they persecute people like this. Right. How, how, how do you do it? How do you feel? I mean, you can get caught at any moment. Do you yeah, absolutely. You, 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 you get in. You make copies of the tapes and get out. You so know, there's, no, uh, there's no. Uh... I mean, there's always a bit of risk. I mean, these stories. You know, not every story is fraught with danger, but yes. I mean, you know, some of them are. They're expensive, dangerous, and they're hard to do. But if they're easy, everybody would do them. You know. So you know, we weigh the risk versus the the chances of actually getting you know what we need, and and we take precautions. I mean, we have a you know fairly strict security protocol, and we operate. Uh, whether it's here or overseas. So I've never been in a situation where I've been uncomfortable. Have I been anxious? Have I had my heart in my throat? Absolutely. Have I been sweaty at the uh, immigration checkpoint getting out, knowing that I've got these tapes in my bag? Unquestionably. But, you know, that's part of the job. And if you don't, you know, push the envelope a little bit, you're not going to get those results. You're not going to get hidden camera video of myself and a producer doing a $10 million counterfeit Viagra deal in Hong Kong. I mean, you're not going to do that sitting in your office. I mean, you make phone calls all day long, but unless you get on the plane, go to the place, do the deal, set it up, accomplish it, keep your act together, and get it back, it doesn't count. What do you say to people in, in college right now who are aspiring to be journalists, whether on television or radio uh, or in print? What do you tell them? How, how is the industry changing? I think the industry is changing in a couple of different ways. You are going to have to feed more information to different places. In other words, when I was working for TV10 Action News in Lansing, I did my stories for TV10 Action News in Lansing. You will have to be able to shoot your own stuff digitally when needed, to edit your own stuff on a computer. Now, I did editing when I was your age, but it was on big three-quarter inch tanks. You're going to have to be able to tell intimate stories for instance, if you're doing something in like healthcare, by embedding with a family who's having a healthcare issue and showing that, you know, in, in an up close and personal way. You're going to have to write stuff for the website. You're going to have to cut another um, shorter video clip for the website. You're going to have to turn the camera on yourself and say, you know, this is what's going on right now. <clears throat> so you can use that as a promotional clip on the web when you get ready to air the, the actual story. So it's just, it, 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 it's, you're going to have to do more stuff and you're going to have to be good at technology that perhaps I didn't have to deal with 20 years ago. Do you see shows like Dateline, people who do these type of investigations, you see, is it growing? And how, is, is media, that, that type of media growing? I think uh, it is. We've had a very good year this year. Uh, we had a staff meeting the other day where our boss said, uh, you know, the numbers are trending up, people are watching, the network sees us as a valuable asset, keep it going. We want more and, and, uh, and better results. But, um, you know, there was all this talk two or three years ago about, you know, the news magazine thing had run its course and whatever, blah, blah. But it, it's still there. I mean, good solid investigative enterprise reporting that informs and entertains is always going to have a place. So you, you, you think that people, maybe not coming to the speech tonight, 
you know, he's not a journalist. He's, he works for a TMZ type Dateline. It's not real, real journalism. What do you think? That are you a real journalist? Do you see yourself as a respectful well, journalist? Yeah, I mean, I, I will put my body of work up against you know anybody in the business, and uh, you know, I, I've always said you know a sports analogy. I mean, we we do we have a doubles, triples, and home runs, and some of the home runs are grand slams, and not every story can be a 12-month investigation. Some we turn around in two to three days. The Vandersloot story we did the other day. So it's a combination of things, you know, and different stories are going to impact people in different ways. But, I mean, you know, TMZ is a whole different mm -hmm. deal. That's not what we do. I mean, we, we uh, uh, you know, we do real news and real you, investigations. You watch TMZ, though, don't you? <laughs> I don't know. It's entertaining. I mean, you know, it's, they've got a right to do what they do. Right. And, and quite honestly, when it comes to a story like Michael Jackson or something like that, they're usually spot on. Mm -hmm. Well, Chris Hansen blindsided me, and I had to do something I didn't want to do. Well, I appreciate you coming on Mondays well, at Midtown. Thanks very much. I appreciate and it. If we can, I hear quick. you do a very mean uh, Keith Morrison and Chris Hansen impersonation. Do I? <laughs> sure, I mean, we could probably do it. It's a small crowd here. We might be able to do it. Uh, but uh, I'll do that if you get up and see, we can see who's taller. Because uh, we had some debate on it. do that. All right, let's, go. Let's, let's do the taller right, first. Right. We're going to do back to back? We can do, I think okay. that's the best way to do right, it. Well, what kind of shoes are you wearing? Well, I'm wearing, oh, can you guys get the same? You know, we, we should rotate maybe this way here. Right, right, so let's again. rotate this right, way. Yeah. Hold on here. All right, you know, I'm wearing normal shoes. I'm older than you. So what, I, what type I, of shoes are you wearing? I don't know. There's no shoes. Chris is taller? Well, that's just great. Well, you can go ahead and my hair is bigger. That's why. Well, I can't get you there. So uh, I guess we could, we, we could do it. You're welcome. I guess okay, we could do it. Keep watching. Let's hear it. <laughs> right now. It was a sunny day in Piedmont, Oregon. <laughs> Did a little Sally Walker, went for a walk on the beach. <laughs> and the thing with Keith Morrison is everything's so dramatic. A little, a little bumper to commercial, you're like, why was the librarian involved? <laughs> Shouldn't she be checking out books? It keeps on, you can keep it going, so. And hey, he? Well, well, you know. <laughs> <We're really laughs> well, we, we, we can do it. We were always thinking, you know, when we, we had dinner with you, we'd be like, this is awkward. This is one of the most <laughs> awkward things I've ever done in life. Um, but it could be good on your resume, really. No, that's that's, that, that's going to be great. Let's, <laughs> let's just do what I usually do uh, when I do these situations. It'd be like, it's just so funny you're being right here doing Chris Hansen's impression. <laughs> um, all right. You ready for this? Okay. It always amazes us how many times <laughs> to catch a predator airs, somebody always falls into the trap that leads them to county jail. Good Take job. this man, Daniel <laughs> Polito. <laughs> Great job. Really appreciate it. It, it, was a, it was a pleasure. Thank Good you. luck with Thank that. You. Right. Well, that was obviously one of the most awkward things I've ever done. Well, it's political time. And we're joining us now is our lead political correspondent and all-around per good person, I would say, JPJ, John Paul Johnson. Good to see you, sir. You as well. Appreciate all right, we got some numbers coming out, record-breaking numbers. $1.2 billion has been raised just by congressional candidates through June for this election. It's a lot of money. Running for Congress is a big business. Yeah, maybe we should you know, bail out. We, well, we don't have to bail out that industry. Maybe we should shift all of our uh, economic policies there. But what do the Democrats have to do uh, for this election? I mean, they're, they're, they're clearly not you know, getting as much money as Republicans, but their president is a Democrat, so. Well, the third party expenditures are one of the big things that are helping Republicans this year. If you look at the RNC chaired by Michael Steele, they haven't been bringing in as much money as the DNC ran by Tim Kaine. Um, if you look at the RGA, however, which is ran by Haley Barber, governor of Mississippi, they have brought in close to 40 to $50 million, which is going to go to a lot of governor's races, which Republicans are up in. If you look at the DCC as uh, compared to the RNCC, the Democrats are all raising them. So in the traditional sectors of raising money, Democrats are actually doing better, but the third party expenditures are actually crushing Democrats right now. Interesting. Um, we, and real quickly, the Fox News versus Robin Carnahan lawsuit. Yes. What's going on there? I mean, you, you, if you watch the ad, right. you're like, what's the big deal? Right. You can look at it in two ways. On one hand, you understand why uh, Chris Wallace is upset. It does make it seem as though he is uh, a de facto endorsement for Robin Carnahan because he's taking some hard hits at, uh, at Roy Blunt. But you can also look at it from the Carnahan standpoint saying that this is free public airwaves. You made the comments on television. Anytime a Republican runs something about a Democrat, you don't see Fox News running you know, to go get a lawyer to file a lawsuit. So I, I, think, this one will be, uh, I think this one will be shot down pretty quick. I don't think it's going to help Robin Carnahan's campaign, but I do think she'll win the lawsuit. Interesting. You know, always good to see you, JPJ. You're Politics welcome. is nothing like, uh, is, is nothing 
without you. I agree. Yeah, I agree. Well, <laughs> our own Avita Caldwell sat down with a lieutenant from the St. Louis City Police Department and talked about crime on campus. Joining me in the studio now is Lieutenant Anthony Rask of the 9th District St. Louis Police. Lieutenant Rask, after criminal incidents are reported to campus police, are they fully turned over to city police for further investigation, or do both departments still work together on the cases? Well, ultimately, the police department is responsible for any criminal activity. But I will tell you, for the few incidents that, that does occur on campus, we do work hand-in-hand -hand with campus security. Uh, I know that uh, your campus security works very closely with our detective bureau. Prior to making the decision to come into SLU, some current students were skeptical about attending because of the media's portrayal of crime in the city. What are some of the things the Knight District do in order to ease the fears of some college students and even the parents? Is there an increase of police in the area because it's a campus or two-man police cars? Well, as I said before, you have very few incidents on, on campus. Uh, the, the campus security does a great job of being visible with their bike patrols and their rowing patrols. But on top of that, the 9th District, we put out three officers that walk a foot beat. Uh, one of the officers walks Grand Avenue, which is the middle of the campus. I have another officer that walks a foot beat on the east end, which encompasses uh, the Chaffetz Arena. And then a third officer walks pretty much in the north end of the district on Lindell Boulevard. What's the most frequent crime, crime that occurs in the 9th District? Uh, car break-ins. How uh, can you, go ahead. Car break-ins, and, and, and the way to, to prevent that for the most part is for the students to not leave anything in their vehicles that are visible um, be it a GPS, book bags, computers, anything that's visible is just an easy, easy invitation for these guys to break in. How can students be involved in crime prevention and possibly safeguard themselves against crime? The biggest thing is not be afraid to call if they see something out of the ordinary. Um, I would recommend walking in groups. If you're alone on campus and you're afraid to walk somewhere don't be afraid to contact your campus security for an escort. Uh, the biggest thing is to get involved. If you see something, call. Thank you for taking the time out to do this interview. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. No problem. Pretty compelling stuff. We'll be right back with the panel. Welcome back. Well, it's time for the power panel segment, and again, always great people on the panel. Starting first with Alderwoman Marlene Davis of the 19th Ward. Marlene, great to see you. Thank you for having me. Brett Kostreski, who he is our senior political analyst slash commentator. Brett? Thanks, Mark. And of course, the wild card this week, Mike McHugh, textbook writer. Mike? Hi, Mark. It's good to see you all. Good to see you. Well, let's first talk about the economy. It's all in everyone's mind. Jobs, you know, I have to find a job here shortly. Um, hopefully it's not going to be too tough. Tim Geithner uh, had an interview today with the USA Today, and he said it's going to take time for the economy to start to, to kick back up, rather, and that businesses need confidence uh, to hire more people. Marlene, in your ward, do you think businesses need confidence right now? Well, uh, I'm blessed that they're not waiting for the confidence to hit them upside the head. Uh, currently, I have a lot of economic development going on. Uh, we have uh, new buildings being built as we speak. We have new businesses moving in. I just talked to uh, the building inspector last week, and the number of building permits have increased since last year. So you're seeing some positive trends. It's and, a positive trend. But that's in your ward. What about the rest of the city? And the city as a whole is doing well, if we think about it. 
there's almost no part of the city of St. Louis that you cannot look at and find new development, new businesses opening. So some people have gotten over it and they've taken a chance, they're investing their money. What I look at now is those who actually mold our economy from behind the doors in the back room. And they're the ones who are trying to you know, create a scenario that says there's not enough money, uh, we can't make it. But if you look at every corporation that we look at, even the car dealers, dealerships that we actually bailed out, they're all doing much better. So you're saying that the buck stops here, no more money? No, I think we need to end it. All right, Brett? Well, it's easy for Tim Keitner. If, ooh, he says it's going to take time. I mean, we've been waiting for two years for this economy to pick up, and I think what we're seeing now is just so much uncertainty in the business market, and I think this administration is very much responsible for that. Uh, these companies have more cash on hand than they have in 30 years. There's over $2 trillion just sitting in the bank, and they have the money to generate, and that's the money that's going to stimulate growth, not the money that the government is uh, using through taxes. So. These companies don't know what to expect yet. They don't know if taxes are going to go up in January. They don't know if health care mandates are going to change. There's a lot of uncertainty in the market, and I think the administration is a big part of that. And I think this administration does need to start taking a more pro-business and a, less, a more certain tone towards the private sector. Mike, you write textbook. What's the textbook going to say about this, uh, this history? or our generation, rather, and this bailout? Well, we actually write a lot about it in the business textbook I work on. Um, uh, uncertainty is the key word. Um, there is an uh, article that I read not too long ago about uh, how consumer demand is gaining steam again, it's rolling down the hill, but too many companies are nervous that it's going to be it's temporary, it's not going to be permanent. So uh, when they have an increase in demand and they need more workers, then they, buy, then they hire temporary workers from agencies. And that's common in uh, the beginning stage of recovery and in the end of a downturn. But what's happening now is that uh, usually when you're a temporary worker, you work at a place for six months, then they give you a job mm -hmm. as a reward for your good faith and for your skill. But now these temporary workers are staying on as temporary workers. And uh, it's kind of uh, bringing in what's, what some are calling like a, a new normal in the economy where, uh, where Ostensibly, in the future, sometime maybe a lot of our workforce will be based on uh, will be based on temporary hours, making them easier to cut away when they need them or bring in when they uh, when they need to too. So, it's really uh, to, uh, going to what Miss Davis said. It's uh, it's really in the hands of the businesses to because the confidence is there. Things are growing, but they just need to I think uh, spend some of that those reserves they have, and uh, it's really in their it's in their uh, it's in their ballpark to to take this on. The Wall Street Journal had an article today talking about the same kind of de deal with the businesses kind of holding on to money and they're afraid about health care. Uh, they have to pay more for health care or small, small, these small businesses have to pay more for health care. Mm -hmm. Do you see that as an issue uh, in this current day economy? Is that the health care bill that they passed earlier this year? Absolutely not. Most of the large changes in the health care initiative will not happen for another 10 to 12 years. So if we're going to sit here on our thumbs for 12 years and do nothing, then that makes no common sense. The law that is changing uh, someday this week, I believe it is, is really helping families and children who have pre-existing conditions. It allows, you know, like the college students, to stay on their families, health insurance until they're age 26. So there's nothing that is going to hurt the business, and especially small business. And, and when I analyze this, it gives them an opportunity to have a tax incentive if they want to provide health care for their employees, and before they never had that. And we also have a way now to actually identify different ways for families to insure themselves. So if they had a policy with someone five years prior and they like that policy, they, it's transfer, you can transfer it to the next business that you go to. So there's a lot of things that have been, I think, clouded in this issue. It has not been clear to the public. Most people did not take time to read it or really listen clear enough to understand it. And it's a shame that we would put this fear out here for small businesses when they actually could benefit from it. Brett, do you believe mandates are the way to go? Uh, absolutely not. And I mean, you can argue that about the constitutionality of mandates, but either way, it's, it's, it can't be good for business. And we saw that these health care insurance companies, we're talking about their 20 plus percent premium increases coming in next year. Now, 
A lot of that's due to different reasons, but they attributed, depending on the company, between 7 and 10 percent to the new health care bill because now they have to cover these pre-existing conditions. They have to cover kids up to age 26. And I mean, these things all have to be paid for somehow. And the company isn't going to take it out of their own pocket to pay for it. They're going to pass it on to their consumers. So you see these companies, small businesses who may have to insure, small businesses who don't know what number it's going to be. I mean, there is, and I think it goes to the anti-business sentiment that's out there from Washington, now whether this bill is going to hurt business or not. But uh, that's, that's definitely arguable. But I think the tone being set by mandates and such bills as this is, is definitely what's keeping our economy from robustly growing. Mike, uh, the, the textbook industry, I mean, it's a pretty small, you have a pretty, it's a small business that you work for, correct? It's hard to, it's almost impossible to get into now. It's, it's uh, limiting to just a few, few certain books. I was lucky enough to, to get in and write for one. So, well, do you, but do you see healthcare as an issue for the employees of that, uh, that textbook? Agency? Well, for my, for my industry, I'm not entirely uh, sure. I think it's, I don't think it's anything different from any other industry. Really, I don't, I don't subscribe to the logic that, uh, that trying to rein in insurance companies with legislation is going to all of a sudden, sudden like unchain them and they're going to uh, cause just a wave of spending destruction on consumers. I think that there has been, I agree with Ms. Davis, there's been a lot of confusion over the health care bill and right now it's just, yeah, the pre-existing conditions, um, uh, you got to cover up to 26 and then uh, and then uh, you are having like subsi you subsidize the employee sorry, excuse me <laughs> employers are subsid subsidizing just a health insurance plan which I only see as good I don't see it as uh, as really uh, lashing out on insurance companies or the consumer I think that it's a uh, that time will tell and it will um, uh, it will it will uh, prove itself to be a, a worthwhile decision instead of just uh, sitting around and waiting for the system and for the insurance uh, the insurance companies to work it out on their own. Interesting. Well, I'm sure we'll be uh, watching the. Uh <laughs> the, the developments in that story for the next 10, 15 years. Real quickly, uh, d to end this conversation, we were having a good conversation in the back here in our green room about, uh, as, I, as I labeled it, brick talk. Uh, New York Times had an interesting article today focusing on St. Louis and Alderman Sam Moore, who's a neighboring ward of yours, um, about the, the, the issue of people setting fire to abandoned buildings just to get bricks. And, and these bricks are pretty valuable uh, to other parts of the country. Do you see this as a huge issue for the city of St. Louis? It is a huge issue, and it comes in so many different forms of public safety. When you look at an abandoned house sitting next door to a house that's in good condition, being well kept, of course, and we can even talk about insurance on that, the insurance cost for that homeowner is higher. There's no doubt about that. And then the threat of safety. We, are, we have people who squat in those homes and live in them. We have drug dealers who sell from those homes. We have so many things that could actually um, be a public safety. But in the long run, it also deals with our economy. If you think yeah. about it, I think the article said we had about 11,000 vacant buildings yeah. sitting in our community. Well, if I could put a multiplier on that, and those were buildings that were being occupied on one level or another, whether it was a $50,000 priced home or a $300,000 priced home, think how much better our economy would be. Think about the sales tax we would collect from those families, the real estate taxes we would collect that would go to the public schools. Let's think about all those things and the funds that would be spent to rehab and occupy those homes. So we're not being very smart about this and we need to do something about it. Right. What, do we, what does the city do to, do to handle this issue? You've got a lot of vacant buildings with valuable brick, St. Louis brick that has a long history. Well, it's really, it's really a shame to see and I think the, the brick issue really does, as Alderwoman Davis said, st stem from the abandoned abandoned buildings problem that's really the greater issue and I mean these bricks could definitely be a boon for the city if you could somehow I know uh, cities in the Rust Belt where I'm from such as Detroit Cleveland and Buffalo who have lost such huge populations have so many abandoned homes thousands of them that the city is taking it upon themselves to go in and demolish them and uh, in St. Louis if that's a, if that's a possibility uh, you could see that brick be sold and that could definitely help the city out with its uh, Ever, ever lessening revenue, and in this climate, so um, there are definitely, but it's it's definitely a huge problem. And when you have so many abandoned homes, well, what do you do? I, I can't, I can never really be sure what the answer to that question is. Mike, you you know a lot about bricks. Oh yeah, brick expert, got it all. Bricks expert bricks. slash textbook author. Got it all. But um, uh, what I really took away from the article was. Uh, the uh, police department's reaction to it, saying that they were going to raise the penalty for uh, for taking and uh, for stealing bricks, and uh, 
that just seems to be putting the putting the blame where it doesn't need to be. You're not going to deter like uh, prohibition doesn't. As right, we you saw how much how valuable those bricks yeah. are. I'll <laughs> risk it. What are you going to raise it from four hundred to six hundred dollars? Okay, I'll still risk it to get these pallets of bricks. Mm -hmm. I don't. Yeah, I don't steal bricks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't see it being an effective deterrent. What needs to be done is uh, is not reactive, but a proactive stance that puts either puts people in back in the homes or clears away the area and does what Detroit and uh, Cleveland are doing with uh, with uh, urban farming, turning turning just vast vast uh, vast amounts of like uh, of urban decay and blight and things that are, like neighborhoods that just aren't coming back, Detroit especially, because there's just miles and miles of it. And they're demolishing it all and uh, and putting in its place like greenhouses where it's going you're gonna make farmers markets in that uh, in that area. It's gonna be thing it's gonna be uh, local organic food that you can sell outside the city. It's just uh, you can there's ways to turn all of that into into a viable economic uh, uh, source, but I don't think reacting against the the poor, starved people who are taking these bricks is a is a proper way to address the situation. Well, I think it's an interesting topic, and I promise you, we will spend a lot of time uh, on this with Mondays in Midtown. We're going to look into this brick uh, brick deal and hopefully uh, get up there and ride around with uh, Alderman Davis to see how bad that issue is. Because if you read the story, and I invite you to read the story as well in the New York Times uh, today on Monday, it's a very interesting story, and I think that uh, the fact that they brought it to the, the nation's attention. Uh, proves to be a, a, an important reason for that. So we'll uh, appreciate you being on the panel this week, folks. We'll uh, hopefully see you soon. And uh, I believe right now it's time for Lyle's Corner. Whoa, it's Lyle's Corner, boys and girls, come on down. You'll learn about cool things around the town. It's Lyle's Corner! Lyle's Corner should just be all three of us our shirts off. Staring at the camera for a good solid 45 seconds of awkwardness. <laughs> I don't know if this should be a record or not, but uh. Probably be done. These two men are about to dance. Did you know that? This game is called Slack Jaw Dancing. You look into your opponent's eyes and you maintain a slack jaw. Any aversion of eye contact or smiling is strictly prohibited. That person will lose. Wait, do we have no music? Wait, wait, we have no music. Come on, you got me get me is going to be here to perform. Uh, this is all presented by SAB, so don't forget. Also, don't forget all week to be voting for your homecoming king and queen. 
Colin Shevlin is an awesome guy. Let me tell you, he's on the ballot. Look for his name, click it, and while you're there, click Kasha Sullivan's. Perfect duo. So that's all today. Or you can vote for Lyle Wilson for Homecoming King. It's Lyle's Corner! Now remember the views expressed on Lyle's Corner don't necessarily reflect those of Mondays in Midtown, or the University, or Father Biondi. Well, right now it's time for the Spotlight on St. Louis. And this week's Spotlight on St. Louis is a good one. Some balloons. We got some pictures from Devin Kostreski, no relation to Brett. Look at these pictures from the Bloom Glow in Forest Park this past weekend. Oh, wow. Those are cool. Look at how those balloons light up like that. Very, very interesting. Mm. Thanks, Devin, for those pictures. Well, we'll always bring you up to date on what's going on in St. Louis here on Mondays in Midtown. Well, we have some viewer mail. You can always write to us, Mondays in Midtown at gmail.com. This viewer mail comes from Paul Merrill in Cleveland, Ohio, although he's from St. Louis. Hey, Mark J., if you could meet anyone in the history of the United States, who would it be and why? Well, thanks for writing, Paul. I would probably re meet Richard Nixon, 37th President of the United States. Why? I think he's a pretty interesting person. And his personality? Whew, I'd like to tap into that. Um, so that's very interesting. If you want to write to us, Mondays in Midtown at gmail.com. Well, that's our show for this week. And to close, we're going to play you some stuff from the B-52s concert that I took. So there's no copyright infringement. You see Fred Schneider and the whole gang do their little weird thing on the stage underneath the arch this past July 4th. Have a good night. Drive safely. It's Monday. We're open. We're open. It's Monday. Edgy. Have a good night. Drive safely. Just looking at some papers. Do my thing. Do my thing. Look at some papers. Okay, it looks good. Sign it off. The Storm Alert Weather Team. Is that fine? Yeah. Is that going to work? Amanda, oh, edgy. You're on the edgy camera.